Good morning, and welcome to the Rise Church Children Service. My name's Curtis. I'm Nicole. I'm Katie. I'm Amy. And we yeah. are the Johnson family. And we're from the southwest side of Indianapolis. We're excited that you decided to join us today as we worship about God. Today, we'll be learning about how God has made a specific purpose for you. And your purpose is the reason for which you were created. Yeah. What do you think you can ask to help you figure out your purpose? God. Oh, good job. What about you, Rona? Who can you ask to help you figure out your purpose? Uh, friends. Friends, that's good. Can you think of anyone else, Candace? Family. Family, all right. And who else? Can you think of anyone else you can ask to help you figure out your purpose, Rona? Grandpa. Grandpa, all right. <laughs> Teachers, that's good. Maybe you can even ask mommy and daddy. How about that? <laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, Candace, that God helped me figure out my purpose. Well, by praying and talking to him and talking to the friends. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, I just thank you for waking us up today and giving us another day of life. And just um, all the things you, you've done for us. I just thank you for all the kids who were able to be here and just enjoy this children's service today. I just thank you for um, um, the lessons we can learn from the book of Esther and just the other uh, books of the Bible, God. And just help us to remember them and take, us, take those lessons and apply them to our lives, God. Guide us for a week ahead, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
The Bible. It's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story. Inspired by the book of Esther. Esther was the queen of Persia. Wait, what? Queen? Esther didn't become queen in the usual way. See, her father wasn't a king, and she wasn't from a noble family. It's just me and cousin Mordecai. In fact, Esther was Jewish. Many of God's people had been captured and brought to Babylon when their home, Judah, was conquered. Then Babylon was taken over by Persia. So Esther grew up in a land that wasn't her own. When Esther's parents died, her cousin Mordecai raised her as his very own daughter. Always remember what our scriptures say. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Love him with all your strength. One day, a new king named Xerxes came to power in Persia. He was so impulsive that he actually fired his queen, Vashti, simply for refusing to show up at a wild party. She will never see me again. When Xerxes had finally calmed down, he had realized he now had no queen. I have no queen. He would have to find a new one. I must find a new one. So the king decided to hold a contest. He ordered his officials to gather the most beautiful young women in the land and put them through an entire year of beauty treatments. Esther was one of those girls chosen. Cousin Mordecai, what do I do? Don't tell anyone you're from a Jewish family. I have chosen my new queen. <clears throat> Drum roll. My new queen is Esther. Mm-hmm. Me? Assume the queenly royal crown. I might have to resize it. Just as Xerxes had so impulsively switched queens, he also promoted a royal official named Haman, higher than all of the other nobles in the kingdom. Bow to me, you fools! Haman was delighted when all of the officials outside the palace bowed low before him. When he discovered that Mordecai refused to bow, he was enraged. You have to bow. Somebody make him bow. Haman was so angry. He made a plan to destroy not only Mordecai, but all the Jews in the land. He laid it out for the king. Your majesty, these Jews live differently than everyone else. They don't obey your laws. Fiddlesticks. That's just wrong. Precisely. Give the order to destroy them. Consider it done. Xerxes agreed to the terrible decree. Messengers took the letter all over the kingdom. Hear ye, hear ye. On the 13th day of the 12th month, all Jews are to be killed. Hear ye, hear ye. When Mordecai and the other Jews discovered the horrible news, they dressed in rough clothing and wept bitterly. Mordecai sent a message to Esther in the palace, telling her what Haman had done. You must ask the king to save our people. Esther was devastated. She sent a response to her cousin. No one can come before the king unless he sends for them. If I do it, I'll die, unless he reaches out his gold scepter to me. Mordecai sent his answer right back. You may not escape, even though you're a queen, who knows? It's possible that you became queen for just a time like this. He's right. Here, tell this to Mordecai. Gather all the Jews. Don't eat anything for three days. I and my servants will fast too. Then I'll go to the king. Esther faced an impossible dilemma, but she took three days to prepare her heart and her mind. Bring my most beautiful royal robes. Heart racing, Esther entered the throne room. Across the long hall, she saw the king seated high on the throne. Breathless, she waited for him to see her. Please, please, please. The king
king looked up, his dark eyes locked on Esther's face. And then he smiled. He reached out his golden scepter. Thank God. What is it, Queen Esther? I'll give you anything, up to half my kingdom. Esther could have made her request right away, but she knew she would have a better chance if she made the king curious. King Xerxes, if it pleases you, come to a feast I prepared today. Oh, and bring Haman. Consider it done. Esther created an elaborate feast for the king and his number two official. <laughs> Look at me, you peasants, invited to the queen's banquet. At the meal, King Xerxes once again tried to discover what Esther wanted. I'll give you anything, up to half my kingdom. Once again, Esther held her ground and waited for the perfect moment. I'd like you and Haman to come to another feast tomorrow. Then I'll answer your question. The king agreed, and Haman spent the whole evening bragging to all of his friends. You guys, the queen thinks I am the bomb. <laughs> but the second feast was a different story. As before, Esther prepared an incredible meal. Both Haman and the king were quick to dig in. What do you want me to do for you? I'll give you up to half my kingdom. Esther took a deep breath. Something told her this was the right moment. Your majesty, let me live. Please spare my people. We have been sold to be destroyed. Haman paled and choked on his fillet, but the king's face flushed red with rage. Who is the man who has dared to do such a thing? Esther turned her gaze on Haman. Haman is the one. In a panic, Haman threw himself at the queen. Totally didn't mean it. Please, please, please let me live. You dare attack the queen? Take him away! That very night, Haman was killed, and the king created a new order that would allow the Jews to be saved. We will celebrate this day with great joy. God had given Esther a surprising position in a foreign nation, and when the time was right, she would use all she had been given to save her people. Hello, my name is Sam, and I hope you enjoyed learning about how Esther learned and fulfilled her purpose. God has a purpose for us that he wants us to learn and fulfill. Matthew 22, 37 through 39 reads, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Love him with all of your mind. This is the first and most important commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Your plan for this week is this. Read Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Discuss how you can love God in new ways and pray that God will help you gain a deeper understanding of his love. Rise Kids, thank you for joining us today. Say it with me this time. Let's have a great week lifting God and loving people. Bye.
call upon the Lord. I will call upon the Lord. Who is worthy to be praised. Who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved, so shall I be saved from my enemies. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God salvation be exalted oh magnify the lord oh magnify the lord who is worthy to be praised so shall i be so shall i be saved from my enemies the lord is worthy to be praised so shall i be so shall i be saved from my enemies and blessed be the rock and let the god of my salvation be exalted be exalted let us praise the lord of let us praise the lord of praise him now and ever praise him now and ever praise the father praise the father son and the spirit lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the god of my salvation be exalted be exalted the lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the god of my salvation be exalted the lord liveth and blessed be the rock and let the god of my salvation be exalted hello 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 um I'm Joey, if you don't know me. I'm from uh, the Bloomington Campus Ministry. Shout out IU, shout out Ivy Tech. Um, I'm super excited to be here with you guys today. There's so many people here who I haven't seen in months. I'm super excited to just worship with you guys and get to glorify God. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity that we get to worship you. Thank you for the freedom that we have to be here on a Sunday morning and be able to worship together. It's been so long since some of us have been able to see one another, and it's just a blessing to be able to do this together. Father, I pray that you can bless this service. Help us to encourage one another and also encourage you. Father, I love you, and I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working we make a miracle work promise keeper lie in the darkness my god that is who you are you brightest of times. God, you are there before us. You are um, helping us in everything that we do. God, even through a pandemic and social distancing, God, you bring us closer. You bring us closer to one another. God, I pray that as we go throughout the rest of our weeks, throughout our months and our years, God, that we can just strive to be closer towards you every day. God, I pray that through all this craziness, that you can show us what really matters in our lives, God, that is love and you. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture will be taken from Isaiah 45, from verses 5 to 8. And it says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. From the I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. You heavens above, rain down my righteousness, let the cloud shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up. Let righteousness flourish with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing a new song called Rain.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we have here together to worship you, Lord. God, these past couple of months have been crazy with the COVID pandemic, the social justice movements, Lord, the election season. Uh, on top of all the schoolwork and work that we already have, God, it's just so easy to get lost in it all. Father, um, for many of us, we've been overwhelmed, living in stress, feeling hopeless. Lord, I pray that instead you can just help us to remember how blessed we are, Father. God, just being here in this church for the first time in months and seeing all these brothers and sisters around me in masks reminds me that I'm not alone in the fight, God. I pray that you can help us to stay connected, encouraging each other to leave, Lord, um, for us to get through this together, Lord, and to come out stronger. Father, I pray that whenever we are out, wherever we are, God, whether it's on campus or our places of work or somewhere else, Lord, that you can help us just to be the light to the world. I pray, Father, that you can help us to look around and see all of the people, Lord, who don't have you, God, who are feeling so stressed and overwhelmed and hopeless, Lord. And I pray that you can help us to follow the example that Jesus gave us and, and to be loving to them, Father. I pray that you can be filled up with your love can pour it out into others, Lord, who desperately need it during this time. It's in your son's name we pray this. Amen. Um, now that the mic is on, I will be reading a scripture from Luke 24, and it says, The same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to a village in Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were, talk they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus, suddenly, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short. Sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, You must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened here these last few days. What things, Jesus asked? The same thing, the things that happened to Jesus. The man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was as mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who would come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some of our women, our, then some of the women from our groups were at his tomb early this morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran to see and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, <laughs> you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in scripture. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining all, from all the scriptures the things con concerning himself. So before communion, we're going to sing Lead Me to Calvary.
to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou was laid, tenderly mourned and wept. Angels in robes of light arrayed, God in thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thy agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Peyton Marshall. Uh, I'm a West Region Yo Pro. Uh, yeah. Heck yeah! <laughs> uh, just graduated from IU Bloom back in May, so <laughs> shout out. Um, I get the opportunity to give communion today, uh, and so I'm going to share a little bit about my own life and, and you know my testimony. So, um, so I'm 22 years old. Uh, I'm the youngest sibling of six. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm the oldest, though. Uh, <clears throat> growing up, to give you an idea, um, two of my four brothers were in and out of jail uh, quite frequently. Um, my amazing, beautiful older sister uh, has Down syndrome. And uh, I remember many, many times uh, looking in the fridge, the refrigerator and uh, not seeing you know, much in there at all. So by worldly standards, you know, many people have told me that, you know, I, I definitely shouldn't have the incredibly blessed life that I do uh, today. And, and I'm actually, I get asked uh, all the time, you know, how in the world are you, you know, in the position that you are now uh, coming from where you came from? And, and for years, I didn't have an answer to that question. 
but now I see inexplicably it, it was Jesus the whole time. And so uh, a scripture I'm, I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with, it's Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 45. Uh, it says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so for most of my life, I was incredibly unrighteous. Uh, and, and looking back, you know, I, I see just these incredible blessings that I've had, you know, throughout my whole life, not just my time as a disciple. And so, you know, no, no matter what was going on, no matter how difficult things were at times, every single one of my needs was always met. You know, I, I always had the right people, the right circumstances in my life at the exact time that I needed them. And so, uh, I, I see now Jesus had a plan a long time ago for me to come to know him and, and to come to walk with him. And so <clears throat> uh, March 8th of this year, uh, I was baptized with my beautiful fiance. Um, <laughs> that was six days after my 22nd birthday. And so I, I want to point something out there. You know, again, I've, I've been receiving these blessings my whole life, and it, it took me 22 years to be baptized into Christ. He was waiting on me for 22 years. And obviously, as we know, for some people, it's many, many more years uh, longer than that. And, you know, personally, if, if I'm waiting on someone for more than like five minutes, I'm like, all right, buddy, chop, chop, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just this morning, actually, I saw this meme. It, it was a squirrel praying. Uh, he's saying, Lord, give me patience, but please hurry. And so 22 years, you know, Jesus is so incredibly patient and humble. You know, he, he sat back blessing me for all that time, watching me sin and not appreciating him for all that he had done whatsoever. You know, to me, that is the epitome of patience and humility. And so to, to bring this to the cross, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the message of the cross, cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so... As we take the bread and the cup, I want to call all of us to remember that it is only by the power and grace of God and thus the patience, the love, and the humility of Jesus uh, for going to the cross for us that we are saved. And so uh, we can bow our heads in, in prayer. Uh, dear Father, uh, thank you so, so much for, for sending your only son to die for our sins. Father, we forget often, you know, just how incredibly blessed we are uh, by you and, and, you know, having our salvation come from that event. Father, uh, I just pray that, you know, we, we can stop taking for granted just how huge, you know, you, you sending your son to the cross was and that, you know, we can, we can examine our own lives and really appreciate just how blessed we are, Father. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to Rise Church. Here's what's happening. Our next community food drive pantry is this Saturday, October 10th. It's from 10 a.m. to noon in the church parking lot while supplies last. This is for members of the congregation as well as people in the community. Check the Rise Church website under the Serving Indie tab to find the list of needed food items. Contributions can be left inside the large container right inside the outside doors to the church building. You may drop these off at any time. Also, you can sign up to volunteer on the church website. Please note, you must sign up ahead of time on the Rise Church website in order to volunteer. Thank you so much to those who have donated and volunteered to help with this signature event over the last several months. If you're a parent of a preschooler, there's a special parenting Devo just for you this Saturday, October 17th. It'll be on Zoom at 9 a.m. Rajan and Janice Bobnani and Sam and Michelle Testa will be teaching the class. If you'd like the Zoom details for the devotional or want more information, text Eric Testa at 317-701-3544. Next Sunday is the second Sunday of the month, which is when we take up a special contribution for Hope Worldwide. We wanted to give you an update on how Hope Worldwide has helped the Bahamas recover from Hurricane Dorian over the last year. Check out this video. On September 1st, 2019, Hurricane Dorian made landfall in the Bahamas. The Hope Worldwide Global Disaster Response Team immediately began preparing to provide relief. Thank you to all who collectively donated over $200,000 to aid the work. Your donations enabled us to do several things. Six days after the hurricane, Hope Worldwide, along with the South Florida Church, took a boat full of 20,000 pounds of relief supplies, including generators, food, water, clothing and medical supplies for the church and the community. Their generosity helped with food and water and provided shelter for the disciples here in the Freeport Church of Christ. Thank you, Hope Worldwide. Hope Worldwide continued to serve in the Bahamas. Over the last year, funding was provided to clean up, repair, and rebuild homes. A team of trained counselors traveled to the Bahamas to help through the emotional toll a disaster like this takes on the lives of those affected. Even now, funding is helping prepare the Bahamas for future disasters. Hope Worldwide was here on the ground in fall of 2019 and has continued to help us rebuild our homes throughout Freeport, Grand Bahama Island. Our home was badly damaged by Dorian. Thank you to our brothers and sisters around the world, we have been able to rebuild. We are once again in hurricane and typhoon season and we anticipate that many outside groups and volunteers will be limited due to COVID-19. I know every person's situation is different, but here's a few simple ways to prepare for natural disasters. You should build a disaster kit for your family. That includes food and water for three to five days, develop a family emergency plan, and follow the advice of your country's emergency management agency. And please always follow the guidelines from the WHO or CDC for COVID-19 safety. There are many great sources of information for disasters, including www.ready.gov, which is available in multiple languages. And of course, be ready to spread hope to your family and neighbors whenever a disaster strikes. We are still not passing trays to avoid the spread of COVID-19. So we encourage you to give to Hope Worldwide using our online giving option, Tithely. You can sign up for online giving by visiting riseindiana.church. Save the date. There will be a marriage retreat on Saturday, October 24th. This is for all married couples, young and old. For over 25 years, the Staten served in the full-time ministry in the Chicago Church of Christ. While Steve brings a systems approach to problem solving, Trisha is an artist and an educator and brings a complementary holistic approach for family, church, and the workplace. Together, they will bring their unique disciplines to this year's marriage retreat, better than you think. Here's what they have to say about marriage. Marriage is a partnership that works best when couples find their sweet spot 
through individual reflection, self-discovery, and harmonizing of their differences. Even the most challenging marriages can experience an astonishing new story. The Cindy Van Dyke Memorial Walk, Run, and Ride was a great success. With 65 physical participants and 82 donors as of Friday, the event exceeded their goal of $7,500 and raised over $9,000. This will be used to finalize our kitchen renovation and get it fully licensed to provide food for the needy, as well as providing funds to help with our monthly drive through food pantry. Thanks so much to all who participated. Well, I appreciate uh, the great job that uh, Noah and others have done in planning the service, and it's great to have us young people be able to, to lead church uh, together. No, they, they've uh, they made an allowance for me to make a, a special announcement. In this uh, era that we're experiencing right now, uh, many of us have unexpectedly lost friends, uh, family members, coworkers, um, and various people in our lives that we didn't expect to lose in 2020. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. We found out uh, this week that uh, Denise Newson uh, lost her beloved mom up in Fort Wayne. And so we want to say a special prayer for their family and really for all of those who have lost loved ones during this time. Please bow with me. Father, thank you that you are the God of all comfort. Thank you that you reach out to us in times when we're weeping and we're hurting and you touch us in a, in a powerful, powerful way with your love and your kindness. We pray for the Newsom family at this time and, and for all of those who are wrestling through the sorrows of having lost loved ones during this time. Uh, bless us as we continue uh, to put one foot in front of the other, as we continue to move forward through this. Help us to be victorious. Help us to, to love people and uh, comfort those who are struggling right now. For we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Our IU campus leader, Nate Leo, is going to be preaching his very last message as a single man. Uh, he and his fiancee, Heather, will be married next Saturday, so I'm going to turn things over to Leo as he preaches the word for us today. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, thank you. Yes, this is my last Sunday as a single man, and boy, am I excited. Am I excited? Uh, let me go ahead and get my, my timer set here, because I have a tendency to, to talk a little bit long. So to, to spare you guys some time, uh, I'm going to get set up here for a sec. But, um, but now, good morning, Rise Church, uh, those of us who are here in person. Uh, it is great to be in person once again. I think the last time that I was here uh, with... Big Church was probably, man, I want to say February. And so it has been a very long time. So, so just the small amount of people here is way more uh, than, what, than what I've been seeing late, what I've been experiencing lately. And man, is it, is it exciting. But, um, but yeah, it, it's great to be here with the Campus and YoPro service today. For those of you who are watching at home, uh, thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a great service so far. A lot of the worship has been really great. Um, I love Waymaker. It's one of my favorite worship songs of all time. Uh, and the new song, Rain, uh, is now creeping up into my top five. Uh, it was the first time I heard it today and sang it in worship, and it's getting up there. And so it's been a great service so far. But uh, if you are watching from your cozy homes right now, I'd encourage you to go ahead and hit that share button and go ahead and comment in the chat, good morning. Say hi to all the people if you haven't already. Uh, but uh, I'm excited to preach uh, today. Over the past few weeks, we have been striving as a church to be a radiant light to those around us. And in this season, as Americans, it is needed now more than ever. 
the first presidential debate was on Tuesday night. And uh, if you watched it, I'd like to say congratulations for getting through a tough hour and a half of television. But it wasn't, for a lot of people, it wasn't really a pleasant night. Uh, it wasn't really a pleasant night. CBS News actually took a poll to, uh, to conduct and kind of gauge how, how Americans who watched it received it. Uh, and what they found was 69% um, of people who were polled felt annoyed. 31% felt entertained, which I guess isn't necessarily a bad thing. 19% felt pessimistic. And 17% felt informed. And those were the only categories. And so you could say that most people who, who sat through that on Tuesday and I didn't have generally great feelings. Didn't have generally great feelings. You know, I also felt annoyed this week. It wasn't about the debate, but uh, on Thursday morning I woke up. I had this really tense pain in my neck and upper back, and I couldn't really move my head to the left or right uh, at all, where I, I essentially just had to pivot and rotate <laughs> to look to whoever I wanted to talk to, and it was really frustrating. And so on Friday morning, I went to the chiropractor and got a little bit adjusted, and it got a little bit better. It didn't fix the problem, but um, I'm still, I'm still kind of, you might be able to see that every once in a while, I'll kind of rotate my whole body to keep my neck from, from, from hurting, but... On the other hand, I'm pretty amped as well. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good. And it doesn't really have anything to do with, with the state uh, or with the presidential debate that just went on. I'm feeling good. Like Dave mentioned, I'm getting married on Saturday. And man, am I excited to get married. I am excited. Man, I, boy, I'm excited. <laughs> but I'm just a big ball of emotion right now. I've got a, I've got a picture here. Um, so this is... Okay, so a series about God, church, God, and politics. We're in this series called In God, uh, in God We Trust. But here's a picture of myself and my beautiful fiance, Heather. Good job, Heather. And she is going to be locked down for the rest of her life coming this Saturday because of me. And man, am I pumped. Am I just so pumped. I'm so pumped. Thank you. Thank you. But like I said, uh, as we continue in our series entitled In God We Trust, today we'll dive into the lordship of Jesus and the things that fight for the throne in his place. The title of my sermon today is A Tale of Two Lords. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 18 through 23. Starting in verse 18, Paul writes, Paul writes, doo -doo -doo. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exalted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Paul writes to this young church in Ephesus about who their Lord is, Jesus Christ. He says, this Lord Jesus was raised from the dead, and he is seated in heaven. Jesus has more authority than any authority on earth. Jesus does not bow his knee to anyone or anything. And Jesus leads his chosen people, the church, like a king leads his kingdom. The Greek word for dominion that Paul uses in verse 21 is kuriotes. Kuriotes. It can be translated to the word lordship. And so we see here in Ephesians chapter 1 that Paul is talking about two lordships. He says there's one that's not Jesus' lordship. There's another lord that demands our attention so it can convince us it is safe and it is comfortable this Lord that is not Jesus takes many forms. This Lord takes the form of wealth. 
This Lord takes the form of success. This Lord can take on the appearance of humility, but be hiding a deep, dark pride. Satan tempts us to follow this Lord in our friendships, in our marriages, in our relationships with our families. And most importantly, we're tempted to follow this Lord instead of the Lord Jesus. The Lord that I'm talking about is the Lord of self. The Lord of self. Church, every single day, we face decisions on which Lord we will follow. The season of our lives sometimes dictate the intensity in which this temptation burns. Denying the Lord of self and following after the Lord Jesus is not an easy task. It is not for the faint of heart. It is not for those who give up easily. The rich young ruler, Pontius Pilate, Judas Iscariot, the Pharisees, Jesus will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and it loses or forfeits, him ver- uh, forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Hard words to those who want to pursue a life with Jesus. If somebody wants to come after Jesus and be his disciple, they must make it their life's priority. Must make it their life's priority. Now, there's something something about this passage in particular that sticks out to me. Um, And for a while, I hadn't really thought about it. But it's, why doesn't Jesus tell us to deny ourselves of a thing? Why doesn't Jesus say deny yourself of anger or of or of impurity, or of lust, or of deception? Why doesn't he tell us to to deny ourselves of a specific thing? It would be a lot lot easier to follow, (laughs) or a lot easier to conceptualize if he told us what to deny ourselves of. But there's a reason he doesn't. He tells us that if we want to follow him, then the Lord of self cannot reign anymore. The command is to deny self. Deny self. Denying the hardwiring of our brain that has taught us to serve our needs and our desires and have us first. I'm going to get mine before you get yours. He tells us to deny this Lord of self that tells us to watch out for us and ourselves first and foremost. A life of lordship cannot be about ourselves any more. Our country, church, has a self-worship problem. Our church has, our, our country has a self-worship problem. We live, in, <laughs> we live in an incredibly individualistic, egotistical, self-idolizing, an opinionated society. A society that thinks personal opinion can be truth. And church, it would be foolish for us to think that that part of our society has not become intertwined in some shape or form into how we act and how we think as disciples. We would be foolish to think that. You know, this is a lesson that I am currently learning uh, as I'm gearing up to become a married man. I was reading Ephesians 5 in my quiet time earlier this week, and I came across verse 25. You know, Ephesians 5, the beginning uh, handful of verses um, uh, is kind of different than the rest of Ephesians 5. Ephesians, the rest of Ephesians 5 is about marriage. <laughs> it's about how to act in marriage and how to serve and love and respect one another. But in verse 25... Paul writes, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did Christ love the church? He died for the church. 
that is a call. That is a high call for me as I prepare to become a husband. I read that scripture and I can't think anything other than my marriage cannot and never be about myself. It cannot be about making sure I'm content and satisfied. My marriage is going to be about denying self and serving my wife. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in The Cost of Discipleship writes this. Discipleship can tolerate no conditions which might come between Jesus and our obedience to him. No conditions which might come between Jesus and our obedience to him. As we approach election day in November, we need to have the attitude that it is not about ourselves anymore. It is not about ourselves anymore. I appreciate last week how Eric preached that we as God's church are the agent of change in this dying and broken and dark world. We are the light church that cannot be hidden, but we need to make sure that we are leading our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, those who we are in class with, to into a greater light, and not into a deeper darkness. Like I said, many of us might have watched the first presidential debate the other night, and it was a spectacle. And I don't know, if you didn't feel some sort of bad emotion, then have confidence knowing that you are an outlier. And I'm friends with a lot of you on Facebook, and a lot of you on Facebook at home. And let me tell you, the, the, the CBS poll that was taken, it's pretty representative of how a lot of us, a lot of us felt. But with this, with all, the, with all the division, with all the, uh, with all the loud opinions, with all of this, with all the anger and all the discord and all the dissent and all the, and all the rage that is going on in our world today, we have the calling to not make it about ourselves by deferring to bitterness, by deferring to anger, by deferring to malice, deferring to revenge. Proverbs 24, 17 says, do not gloat when your enemy falls. When they stumble, do not let your heart rejoice. How many of us defer to this attitude when we encounter someone we sharply disagree with? Church, have we been letting bitter roots grow up in our hearts? And at the end of the day, once November comes and we have a new president, what do we gain from one man being in office and the other? What do we truly gain? Our lordship is not of this earth. Our lordship to Jesus is not about serving self anymore. It is not about ourselves Oftentimes when we look at the cost of Jesus' Lord, uh, when, when people look at the cost of Jesus' Lordship, they turn away. <clears throat> it happens plenty of times in the scriptures. I mentioned just several earlier. But this, this notion of turning away from the hard commands of Jesus and the ways that Jesus is calling us to deny ourselves, not make it about, about ourselves, is not something that, that is, is that far from us even as disciples, as God's church. One of, the most, one of the most damaging ways that Satan deceives us is by convincing us that the cost of following Jesus and his commands and sacrificing is greater, than the, uh, is greater than the payout, greater than the reward of following Jesus. I wanna ask you, church, what do you believe the reward of Jesus' lordship is? Not just what you know intellectually, heaven, eternity, peace. Those are easy answers. But do you believe that there is a payout, a reward to following Jesus for your entire life? Oftentimes, since we cannot, the way, the way we live right now, our incredibly materialistic culture, if something is not right in front of our eyes, then we do not believe that it is worth more than something that we have to wait for. Immediate gratification. 
But a life of discipleship is not about immediate gratification. Giving up this romantic relationship that I'm investing so much in is not worth it, uh, even though it's filled with self selfishness and lust and impurity and immorality and deception. But giving up these friendships that make me feel so welcomed isn't worth it, even though I'm regularly tempted to sin when I spend time with them. That giving up my career aspirations is not worth it, even though I have to sacrifice my convictions and manipulate who I need to and to step on whoever's toes I need to just to get there. We could try and justify the costs of the things that we love that drive us away from Jesus. But little do we realize that there is an incredible reward. Little does this earth know that there's an incredible reward when we make Jesus Lord and live a life of lordship to him and not a lordship of self. When we make Jesus Lord, life ceases to be about self, begs the question, what then is the promise, the reward of this lordship? What is the promise? And that's my next point. The promise of lordship. In, uh, in 1906, a man named Soichiro was born in a small village in, in Japan. I'm not going to say his last name because that would give the entire story away. But uh, when, when this man Soichiro uh, was young, he grew up working with his father in his father's bicycle garage. And by the age of 15, he moved to Tokyo with very little formal education. And he landed this apprenticeship at this auto garage where he could become trained and learn how to work, uh, how to work on cars and, and, and bikes and stuff like that. But he stayed there for six years before returning back home to his, uh, to his village in Japan where he could open up his own auto garage. After this, after he moved back home with all this education uh, and experience, he, he had the idea that he would develop a new piston ring for the engine inside of a car. If you don't know what a piston ring is, all you need to know, it's a metal ring that your engine cannot run without. Uh, but basically, he said, I'm going to create this, I'm going to revolutionize this, and I'm going to go sell it to Toyota. And so he took on this challenge. He had to sacrifice a lot. He and his wife struggled so financially that at a point they had to pawn off his wife's wedding ring just to be able to, to make ends meet. But when he finally completed this finished piston ring, he took his design to Toyota, and they told him, doesn't meet our standards. You gotta try again. After years of trying for this one design, all it takes is just a day to snatch that hope. But you know, he was like, all right, I'm, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna work on this and I'm gonna get it better. And so he actually decided to go back to school uh, in hopes of kind of like reinventing the wheel and getting this, creating this thing that was up to Toyota's standards. Two years later, he got a contract with Toyota to develop their piston rings. But his hope was lost again when he didn't have the resources, the money, or, or the, the workforce to be able to, to create and maintain a factory to mass produce these piston rings. And so he couldn't find these resources um, to make this factory, but he actually developed a new way of making concrete in order to, to create this factory for a much cheaper cost. And so hope, hope lost, hope regained, hope lost, hope regained. And every single time he faced a setback, he had to count the cost of if it was truly worth it to keep pursuing this dream. But he ended up finishing his factory and they started producing piston rings. But in 1944, near the end of World War II, an American B-29 bomber took out half of his factory. Took out half of the factory. And in 1945, as they were rebuilding this manufacturing plant, an earthquake hit and destroyed everything else. You know, most people would have given up at this point, probably earlier, honestly. Uh, when they had to go back to college, they probably would have given up. <laughs> but so Ichiro, he found a new way. He kind of reoriented his vision, uh, but he, he found a way to attach a small engine onto a bicycle to get around a little faster, be able to go farther distances and stuff like that. But but he had no money. And so what he did 
what he did, he had to obviously count the cost again, but he actually wrote 18,000 letters to bicycle, bicycle shops around the country of Japan, asking them to help financially. So many of the shop owners responded with financial help that after plenty of funding, he was able to produce the very first Super Cub motorcycle, which by 1963 became the top-selling brand of motorcycle in the United States of America. You know, I said this at the beginning, that if I shared his full name, that it would give away the entire story. His name is Soichiro Honda. And a lot of us, probably about 50% of us, have benefited from him. Soichiro Honda had plenty of costs to count in this journey. Every time he faced a new challenge, the cost got even more expensive. Literally and figuratively. But the reason that he did not turn away at the growing cost was because he saw the reward as more valuable than the cost. Rise Church, we have a greater reward than Soichiro Honda did. We have a greater reward. Our reward gives us hope, not just in this life, but in the life to come. This, the, the, a hope that extends far beyond this life. We have a reward that no government, no politician, no president can stack up against. N neither Donald Trump nor Joe Biden can promise us the same as what God promises to those who follow him. Go to Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. When I think of the promise of a life following God, I think of this scripture. Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will, will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at a hundred will be thought as a mere child. The one who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat the fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long, uh, will enjoy the work of their mis... Uh, hold on, I skipped a line there. My chosen ones will long to enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children doomed to misfortune. For they will be a people blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. When the new heavens and the new earth come, there will be no pain. There will be no anguish. There will be neither death nor brokenness, neither conflict nor hostility or anger, no division. No more of this world's trauma will exist in the new age, in the promise. There will be redemption. There will be life and there will be joy and there will be peace and there will be an eternity of it. This is our reward. And church, we would be gravely mistaken to forfeit at the sight 
of such an expensive cost. We would be gravely mistaken to forfeit the promise that is laid out for us at the sight of an expensive cost. This is why Jesus tells those who want to come after him, who want to follow him, to count the cost of a life following him. Lastly, Bonhoeffer writes in The Cost of Discipleship, when the Bible speaks of following Jesus, it is proclaiming a discipleship which will liberate mankind from all man-made dogmas, from every burden and every oppression, from every anxiety and torture which afflicts the conscience. Church, as we close out, if we proclaim to be the light of the world, let us not underestimate the intensity by which that light burns. We have a responsibility to those around us, a responsibility to those who are in the dying and broken world to lead them out of that darkness and towards liberation and redemption. We do this by turning away from the Lord of self and fixing our eyes and lives on Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for today. For the incredible time of worship, Father. For the incredible time of being able to come to you this morning, lifting our hands up to the creator of the heavens and earth, the creator of the, this life on earth, as well as the creator of the promise of eternity in heaven, where there will be no anger, no strife, no division, no brokenness, but only healing, redemption, and life. Father, thank you so much for this day. I'm encouraged and filled up seeing people in person at church here in the sanctuary, God. Lord, I pray that as we go out from today, we would, we would live out Matthew chapter 5, being the light of the world to this dark and broken world. I love you so much, Father, and it is in your name. Amen. Rise Church, this concludes our service. Service. Thanks so much for coming if you're here in-house.